In a previous video series, I demonstrated a number of different features which I've included in my configuration of NeoVim for writing LaTeX documents, showing how I use those different features for academic writing. In this video series, I'm going to focus on what you need to do to adapt my configuration to your exact needs, going through all the different plugins and key mappings which you might want to change given what feels most comfortable and usable to you. I thought it'd be useful to begin by comparing them to both the typewriter and the word processor. So you have to imagine that when people first started using typewriters that it was a somewhat tedious task to learn how to touch type, but that if you did so you could not only produce written documents which were much more uniform in appearance, but you could also write a lot faster. And that you found something similar with learning how to use a computer and how to word process that whatever time that took that it was vastly outstripped by the increase in efficiency being able to work on multiple files at once being able to cut and paste blocks of text uh, being able to undo changes and so on and i think something similar can be said of vim that it does take some time to learn all the different vim conventions and to get good at them but that doing so will just vastly increase your overall productivity and is something I think well worth doing for any academic who's going to spend a lot of time interacting with text. So I think it's also helpful to say a little more about what it takes to learn Vim. So there's the sort of standard Vim conventions uh, which you will have to commit to muscle memory and this takes some practice for me it took some two weeks before I started to feel some comfort using them and felt like I was experiencing a net gain in overall efficiency. Um, but then there's also, in a way, the greater task of extending Vim by adding plugins and starting to use those different features, um, augmenting your workflow and um, with, yeah, with their aid. And this is something which I think is a lot more personal. Um, I think there's good reasons to mostly stick to what the Vim conventions are. Um, which I'll mention below. But I think that, you know, there's also good reason to sort of explore what else is out there and to see, well, wh what would be really useful um, given my needs and how can I integrate those into my workflow, which key bindings work best for me, um, and so on. And I think to some extent, you know, there just will be idiosyncrasies. So not only are people's needs going to be different, but people's keyboards are going to be different. And what is comfortable for me may not be comfortable for you. And so I'll go through how to make the necessary changes in order to adapt my configuration um, to whatever your needs are. Um, I think a useful metaphor here is auto mechanics. So, you know, starting with just stock Vim and going on the internet and seeing what plugins there are is a bit like starting with a chassis and just like wandering through this infinite store of parts um, all free which you can contemplate adding to to the car and you know as overwhelming as that is um, there is just a vast amount of freedom there um, which can also be sort of exciting and that's what motivated me to sort of put together this current configuration um, a lot more manageable is starting with a car which is already built out, and that's a bit what I'm providing. Um, at least this is some something to take apart and to look at and to see all the different pieces, and then to ask yourself, well, how can I adapt this um, to, to what I need? You know, taking the car apart, looking at the different parts you might find, and, and replacing parts uh, as needed. Um, so, yeah, I... I do want to say a little bit more about um, why Vim in the first place. So, you know, there are other rival programs like Emacs, Sublime, VS Code, Atom, and so on. Um, and although I enumerated some reasons, you know, why I think Vim is superior in a previous video, I bumped into a number of further reasons. So I thought I would just collect a complete list here. Uh, so motivating, you know, the somewhat arduous process of downloading my configuration and adapting it to, to your needs. So to begin with, Vim is extremely fast. Um, it's 
you know, everything from just opening a file just in a, a split second to, you know, all the different functions you might want to perform in editing that file. Um, it's really nice to have a really responsive text editor. Um, so this is one of the things I like most about using Vim. Um, by comparison, I know that um, Sublime is considerably faster than VS Code, which is itself faster than Atom. I'm not actually sure how Emacs compares um, to those three or or to Vim. I do know that Vi Vim is faster than Emacs. I'm not sure by how much, um, but that all of these IDEs are just a lot heavier than Vim to begin with. Um, and they include a lot of features which you just may not need for academic writing. Um, and so, you know, by comparison, Vim is very lightweight and you can sort of extend its functionality only as needed. And, and that's exactly what I've tried to provide here. Um, I, another thing to mention is that the Vim key bindings themselves, you know, represent a very mature set of conventions going back, I'm told, to the late 50s with EX, which then became VI, and then Vim in the 70s, and, you know, it's been sort of maintained up until today, and for good reason. Uh, you know, people have thought very carefully about all the different things you might want to do to navigate and edit a text file, and how to do that with a standard keyboard. And, yeah, answering sort of that design problem is really what the, the Vim key bindings um, provide. So I think there's yeah good reason to stick to them and to not you know create a completely idiosyncratic collection of conventions. Um, and a further reason is that you find the Vim key bindings you know in other programs. So for instance, um, you know you can use a browser which has a plugin which allows you to use Vim key bindings or inside your email client or on your file explorer on your machine and so on. And even if you don't necessarily want to start off using all of those things, once you get really comfortable using Vim, um, yeah, if you're like me, you'll find that, you know, being forced back into just editing text in the old fashioned way, pointing and clicking with the mouse and so on, is just unbearable and that um, you will want to switch to an email client which allows you to um, interact with the text in a Vim way. Um, one further thing to mention is the sort of multimodal um, functionality, which is included in, in Vim, where you know you switch between insert mode, where you're sort of adding text, to normal mode, where you're navigating and editing text, or visual mode, where you're selecting blocks of text, or command mode, where you're sort of entering specific commands, whether they be sort of commands that come default with Vim or um, are included. Um, with one of the plugins that uh, that you install. Um, and I think that's a, a real advantage to using Vim um, instead of, you know, something like Emacs or Sublime or VS Code and so on. Um, I should say that, you know, each of these programs has a Vim mode, um, so you can turn on those kind of conventions. Um, and I feel like in some sense that alone says why Vim is so good. It's like if each of these are sort of resembling Vim, um, why not just start out with Vim? Um, especially if you're going to, you know, gain a net increase in speed. So, so yeah, I think that that's kind of further further reason to use Vim. Um, another nice thing about the the Vim conventions is the way in which they're language like. So, um, you have nouns for text objects, and you have verbs for the different actions you might want to perform, and and modifiers and, and so on. And so, you know, after some practice that the different things you want to do to the text, you will have those thoughts in the language of Vim itself. You'll, and so it becomes very natural to just use and remember the different, um, the different conventions and, and key bindings. Um, a further reason is good posture. So I think using these conventions and not using the mouse uh, nearly so much um, and you know, changing the conventions here and there as as needed um, to fit whatever's most comfortable for you. Um, that there's good reason to do that, just from a posture perspective. That you know, if you're going to spend a lot of time writing text uh, for many years to come, that it makes sense to really investing in you know a comfortable setup, which you can do for hours on end uh, for year after year. Um, it's also using Vim. Not only is it sort of responsive program to use. 
but it's really fast once you get good at it and you can really um, be quite efficient and that's really satisfying um, it's nice to not have to you know have the mouse in your way or to feel clumsy inside a computer um, so yeah there's there's really a very um, whereas with you know standard word processors you know fairly quickly you kind of plateau, plateau in your skill level whereas with Vim you know okay there's a certain threshold you have to cross before it really becomes pleasant to use but then after that you know you can continue to invest in learning and getting more and more efficient for for many years to come and I think that's well worth doing if this is you know one of your main occupations um, yeah and then a the last thing is that it is fun using Vim there's lots of nice little features which you know you can start to learn how to use to become more efficient um, and that's just really satisfying um, so yeah, and you know, the same can be said of customizing it, that it's a little bit like tinkering on a car and that, you know, it doesn't have to be finished, you know, completely the way you'd want it to be for it to still be extremely usable and, you know, much more efficient than any alternative that, you know, you can still have maybe open issues, things you'd like to resolve, little other features you'd like to add or change and so on. Um, so it can be a work in progress. Um, yeah, so the next thing I want to say is that, um, yeah, I guess unlike some of these other IDEs that really start off all bloated um, with all this stuff you may not need, you know, Vim, you kind of start from something fairly sparse and you just kind of build up as needed. Um, I think that's a real advantage, uh, which recommends it. Um, and sort of related to that is that this is in keeping with the Unix philosophy. So the idea is, is that software should serve one purpose and should serve it extremely well and that if you have some other you know problem to solve or some other um, purpose to fill that you should have a different piece of software to serve that purpose and to serve that purpose really well um, and so instead of kind of software just kind of growing in size and becoming this you know tumorous mass um, you know like some of these other larger IDEs that it's better to have yeah you know, sparser slimmer you know pieces of software which um, really just try to do one thing and and that you know then you can navigate between the different pieces of software and have them talk to each other um, all on your machine um, and and I think Vim does a really good job of this um, and yeah it is somewhat universal this is something that I think is maybe more important for people who are using many different machines you know maybe you're signing into different servers or so on. Um, that's not really something I'm doing, but I do like to know that, you know, if I need to edit a text file on anyone's computer, um, it's very likely that Vim will be installed. Certainly it's pre-installed on any Mac or any Unix operating system, um, any Linux operating system. And yeah, that I, you know, can can use the standard Vim bindings to edit, you know, with, with some efficiency, um, independent of the sort of further advantages that I've included in the configuration of my own machine. Um, yeah, and I guess one other thing to mention is the likelihood of that Vim will continue to endure for some time. Um, I saw that there was a survey conducted in 2019, provided this was among software engineers, but um, Vim was the fifth most popular, which is really saying something. It's a very old program and that um, it's not only still popular, but that's actually gaining in popularity is, I think, quite a promising sign. Um, there's just a huge space of plugins that have already been developed. There's just a huge amount of resources out there, you know, for learning Vim, for getting better at Vim, um, huge number of tutorials, you know, all free on YouTube or elsewhere. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's something that, you know, a really active community provides, whereas, you know, Emacs was not even on the list, um, and, you know, others have kind of had their heyday, like Sublime became really popular, but is on the decline, and, you know, VS Code is extremely popular, but um, but not necessarily the best suited for, for academic writing. Um, yeah, one other sort of promising thing about NeoVim in particular is that um, because it now allows... Um, people to write plugins uh, using Lua that instead of Vim script and that there's a kind of uh, yeah democratization of 
e or even further de democratization of um, yeah adapting uh, NeoVim to to users' needs. That there's been sort of a, a boom of interest in NeoVim, and um, yeah, I think a quite a quite vital community that is is rising up. So if anything, Vim is in a in a renaissance rather than just kind of hanging on. And so yeah, there will likely be um, an active community around Vim for many years to come. And that you know this this will basically provide a community of support. You know if you ever um, run into issues or need help, that there will be a lot of qualified people out there who can who can help you. Um, related to this is the good documentation. So there is just an unbelievable amount of documentation for all the different, you know, things you might want to do inside Vim. I mean, this comes up all the time in in interacting with your configuration and learning how to configure um, Vim for yourself. So um, just to switch into my configuration, say I want to know what source does. Um, if I just hit enter, then it brings up, you know, these um, help files and it tells me a little bit about what it does. and you know, if I'm inside this help file, I see, oh, global, what is that? And I can, you know, just easily hop around, um, you know, learning whatever it is I may need to learn. Um, and, and so that that is extremely useful and makes, uh, yeah, learning at least the sort of, uh, yeah, back end to Vim, the sort of uh, behind the scenes um, parts of using and customizing Vim uh, just a lot easier. Um, and then a last sort of, virtue that I, I wanted to mention um, is that, you know, at least for myself, that, you know, I haven't really needed to learn that much about computing. Um, I've just needed fairly basic functionality. And that Vim has, in a way, been a sort of a window into just another world of computing and computing at a somewhat more sophisticated level, you know, using um, the um, terminal, for instance, to install programs and to, you know, run commands inside your computer and to navigate. And becoming comfortable with all of this um, has really just, yeah, felt um, well. It's been quite eye-opening and and interesting, and and I feel like there's no going back at this point. Um, you know, I've switched to using Linux, and by comparison, you know, I find that this is just much better than sort of being beholden to whatever design choices, um, you know, Mac or Windows uh, sort of impose on you with new updates and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I feel. Uh, you know, for, for those who are not programmers, um, that, you know, the sort of a silver lining of, of all of the, the hard work of customizing Vim for yourself is gaining sort of a new, a new skill set and, um, yeah, learning to speak a new language. So, so these are some reasons that I find Vim to be just vastly superior to certainly something like, uh, Microsoft Word, but also to, uh, you know, editing LaTeX in a very simple text editor like TechShop, which affords you, you know, very few um, sort of conveniences, um, or to sort of sophisticated IDEs, which are, you know, somewhat bloated, not really designed with academic needs in mind. Um, so hope you feel sort of motivated to learn Vim, and, and if you do so, um, to configure it for yourself. And I hope to make this video series just as a resource to adapt my configuration to your exact needs, sort of rebuilding the car uh, for yourself, as it were.